Every so often you have technology come along that rewrite the rules of the game. Digital culture isn't characterized by the home computer. You speak instantly to a man standing on the shore of France. The cyber station, the USA, the dot com. Everything has changed. A new age. The biggest ride in all of history. This is cyberstationusa.com. This is the future. The future. The future. The future of radio. And that really is the message. We need to open our eyes. This is Sparta! <laughs> you want answers? I want the truth! Everyone thinks they know all the different sides. I like to say there's, there's one more side. That's the Cohen side. Cyberstation USA. Nice. <laughs> the Cohen side. Real political debate. You can't handle the truth! Folks, welcome to the Cohen side. You're in for a spectacular show today. And, you know, I say that often, um, and there's, I'd say 90% of the time I mean it, uh, but today I think it's going to be something special. Um, I want to let you guys know that we actually have um, an interesting confluence of events here with the Cohen side. Um, we actually have um, a correspondent, if you think about it, with, uh, with us, Nasser Wadadi, who was on our last show, who actually predicted that the hot spot in the globe right now was Tunisia. And lo and behold, maybe about a day after he's talking to us on this show, um, there's a revolution in Tunisia. So we are actually going to have Nasser Wadadi back on this show for part two of his insights on what's going on in terms of democracy, rights, and uh, Islamism in the Middle East. Uh, it's fascinating stuff. And here's what I want to be very clear about. Um, it's not just that Nasser spoke about it. And, and Chuck, I don't know if you know this, this is very interesting, and Joe too. It's not just that Nasser spoke about it on the show, but you guys remember, oh, I don't know, Iran about a year ago when there were those revolutions and they called it like the Twitter revolution? Yeah. Well, the Twitter revolution is Nasser for Tunisia. Like he's the guy that's been tweeting you know, all this stuff you know. back and forth. Yeah, you, absolutely. You should be making national news for that because when that happened, I said that. To yeah, myself. no, nobody's talking to Nasser. I mean, I see his tweets, yeah. and I said, and so I said, Nasser, you got to come back on the show. And he was absolutely because people need to know about this stuff. Um, so and we of are. Course this program is heard in North Africa. Absolutely, absolutely, and again, again, Cyber Station USA yeah, around the globe. This is the whole point, folks. We can be on the cutting edge because you know what? There are no airwaves that make it to, uh, <laughs> to right. North Africa, as far as I as I know. But they've got airwaves these, are a thing of the past, David. I think they are. But, I think they but are. They've got their cell phones and they've exactly, got their, uh, apps exactly, and all the rest. So if you are listening, if you are listening in North Africa, cyberstationusa.com, coincide.com, click in. You, you can get a live feed from the show. You can listen later to hear what Nasser has to say about what's going on in your country. Yeah, you that's know. that's the fascinating stuff about this show and about what we're trying to do here. Um, I'm hoping uh, that we have on the air with us right now uh, Nasser Radati, Civil Rights Director for the American Islamic Congress. Nasser, you're with us. Yes, good morning. Good morning. Yeah, How are you doing, Nasser? Good morning. Nice to hear you. First of all, thanks for joining us. Um, I was speaking earlier in the show that uh, you know what you are doing on the on the real on the forefront of what's happening in Tunisia is something that we really need to hear more about. And uh, I'm hoping that you get more opportunities to speak on shows like this to let people know both what's going on and and what you're doing. I thank you for sharing. You know all the all the feedback that you showed me about what's happening over there and your involvement in it. Um, I would kind of want to get right to it. I want to hear, you know, uh, what's been happening, uh, what is really going on there right now. We've all read stuff in the news about who the, uh, who the new uh, leader is coming into power. What do you make of that? And, and what really <clears throat> is going to happen going forward? So, I mean, you take us where you want to take us. I'd, I'd love to hear more about what led to this point, if, if you can, though. Sure. I mean, this is, this is an incredible story that very few people would have, would have believed in. I mean, literally, I am not. I'm weighing carefully my words here. Yep. This is the stuff of legends. Uh, a man, uh, an unemployed man, who 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 basically gets uh, tries to make a living, um, uh, buys a cart, starts selling vegetables. The police comes and claims that he needs a license to to uh, to sell vegetables, and and then they beat him, break his cart. Supreme humiliation. I mean, this is a country that offers no uh, no legal redress whatsoever. So he goes in front of a uh, the government, try, like trying to talk. They don't listen to him. So he just picks up uh, uh, some gas and sets himself on fire. I mean, the and then everything. Uh, Thirty days later, the dictator is running out like a. Um, running out with his wife, who took with her 1.5 uh, tons of gold. 
And what we're looking potentially at is basically a democracy in the works. And the beautiful thing about it is that it does not have Islamists in it. Any, it does not have, uh, there was no one shooting except for the government killing its own citizens. It's a peaceful uprising. And um, the, the, the implications for the rest of the region are profound. Now, I, as a part of AIC's work, we have a civil rights program called HAMSA. And part of what it does is that it trains, um, it trains the activists uh, from the region. We've been doing that for the last five, uh, five or six years. And uh, part of that is that basically keeping an eye, uh, keeping an eye on, uh, on what's happening online, because we've discovered that uh, online tools are a great way to, to basically operate, spread ideas, and connect with, uh, with uh, relevant people. And in the process, so we have a big network of people that, that basically emerged in the last five, six years. These are activists, journalists, reformers, liberals in the classical sense, not, uh, not, not in the partisan sense. Right. Um, and uh, they, uh, th- these are basically the people who started delaying the news. And I became, uh, became basically a hub. It's like a fo- uh, over Twitter basically relaying the news of what's happening on the ground, and at the same time very actively trying to recruit journalists uh, um, to start covering the story and also understanding, making, uh, making sense of what's happening um, on the ground and sometimes giving ad- uh, advice and feedback uh, to those who seek it. And the, I mean, the fascinating thing is that uh, I, I was one of the first in the few who actually started following this, and by the end of uh, by the end of uh, by the by the overthrow of Zain Abidin bin Ali, uh, the uh, I find like basically my tweets apparently were posted in Al Jazeera live, uh, and uh, I've become one of the people who who are trusted sources on what's going on around. It's basically citizen journalism. I think the the, the lesson also to take away from that is that. Amidst such monumentous events, private uh, private individuals can play a, uh, a role in, in big events using online tools and uh, relaying news and information, and most importantly, learning about what's happening. Now, now in terms of people outside of Tunisia learning about what's happening, I'm curious about two questions. Is it is it a sure. chicken and the egg situation where you say people are monitoring it and then they see what's happening? And um, then, then, then other then they relay more messages back and forth. In other words, what comes first? And the second question is: talk a little bit about the impact, because I mean, the, the people don't have, uh, unless I'm wrong, wide access to information about what's going on. Do you then become a resource for them to let them know that this is happening and and we should keep at it when you talk about things like advice and and guidance? Uh, just talk about that, because it's a fascinating development. Yeah, it, it is actually like um, the, the interesting thing about it is that I, what I did, what I didn't mention in, in um, earlier is that Tunisia under Ben Ali had one of the most aggressive censorship operations in the world. It was, by the way, classified as one of the like one of the ten worst countries to be a blogger, and then classified by RSF uh, Reporters Without Border as an um, uh, an enemy of the internet. Right. You mentioned that in one of your articles, that that was the case, even though, you know, the United States is still counting them as a friendly ally in the war on terrorism, that kind of thing. Same thing with Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is called an ally. And no like question. Where, but, the, I mean, Saudi where, Arabia where is talked about a little from. more. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Saudi Arabia is talked about a little bit more, but not ha- held up to, uh, to standard. Uh, uh, they're not held accountable for, for what they do, um, for complicated other reasons. But the thing is that Tunisia was... Uh, the, the 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 fascinating thing is that Tunisia was like years and years of propaganda made uh, m- made it seem to outsiders that this is like a small uh, developing country, the miracle of North Africa, while it was really a brutal dictatorship that um, curtailed and um, curtailed uh, its citizens' rights and uh, and 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 basically ran a full-blown uh, police state. It was actually, interestingly, it was 
uh, and that's why this is such a monumental event because the Tunisian Tunisian regime uh, was considered as the most efficient dictatorship in the Middle East and North Africa. Now, did and he shockwaves of their falling are uh, basically scaring her government? Well, I Arab hope regimes. so. I hope so, and if, and if that's the case, you know, definitely kudos and an amazing, you know, uh, I would just say uh, credit given to you for your role in all this. Uh, in terms of the falling, though, my question, did they lose the support of the military? Did the widespread public uh, protest uh, really instill some worry on the fear of the military leaders? How, in fact, did the fall actually take place if it was such a repressive regime? Yeah, it's actually um, the... the that's why, like a lot of us, a lot of us who, who basically work in the fields who are following this, um, like know the region, were, were caught by surprise because um, the, the government basically kept on bungling this. They instead of like coming out public, like and calming people, the guy comes out on his first speech and calls his own nation terrorists, and then basically he kept on inflaming uh, people, and then. By week two, they all started opening fire. Hmm. By the way, 60 people died in the process, and not a single protester like, um, um, uh, shot a bullet because there, there were no weapons involved in this. And uh, by the time it ended, it was clear that um, uh, it started in, in, in the deep south, the internal side of Tunisia. Mm -hmm. Now it moved like the protest. People started taking to the streets, uh, students, workers, labor unions, etc., and basically, the, the on on the day before he he felt like they were they were they were the the people basically were taking the streets in the capital city of Tunis, which was his last defense line. Mm -hmm. He did not count on that spreading up to his capital. And by the time it arrived there, it sixty people were dead. He had made three TV speeches. The last one, he basically, I mean, it's it was historic. The stuff of legend. No one could have foreseen an Arab dictator like on TV begging the people, like I heard you, I understood you, I'm so sorry. Um, big mistakes were happening. I'm not going to run again. And then it was clear that either he leaves, or the people are going to get in the palace and drag him, uh, drag him there, out of there. So it's all of the information is still need, needs to be verified. What, uh, what seems to have happened is that, first of all. Um, the, the head of the military, which is not the big force in Tunisia, the big force is the police. And mm. the statistics, by the way, show us that uh, um, there, there was the quota was that for every 10 Tunisians, there was one policeman. But for um, there was one doctor for every 1,200 Tunisians. That's how many. This is, that's how how much of a police state it was. So the head of the military, who halfway this refused to issue orders to his troops to fire on, on, on the civilians, he was sacked, ah. General uh, Ben Ammar. And apparently he was reinstated by his colleagues uh, in the last day, um, who basically were like, what do we do with this? And apparently, and this remains to be verified, um, I'm almost like sort of 70, 80% sure of what I'm about to say, Apparently, they issued him. Um, they issued him an ultimatum: you either leave, or we will let actually the people go take uh, take you down physically. Mm. He 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 left, and in the process, in the last day, his wife um, went to the central bank of Tunisia and stole 1.5 tons of gold, and then ran away. Um, they flew out. They tried to uh, seek refuge in France which is, by the way, the big scandal of all of this is France, hmm. that they were defending him till the last minute, till wow. the dying breath. They sent out three government ministers, one claiming that Tunisia, talk of Tunisia being a dictatorship um, is an exaggeration. The second one said that, look, we can't criticize, um, we cannot give the lessons of morality to foreign nations. And uh, the worst was the foreign minister, Michel Aliomari, who said in Parliament uh, during the protest and while Tunisians were shot for, uh, and killed for expressing their opinions, she said that France would be happy uh, to send the uh, police to, to help control the situation. Wow.